Greetings, Spin Zone fans. Uh, welcome to another episode. This was part of the BC Club from several months back. Um, but there will be new Spin Zone episodes on the horizon. So we thank you for your patience and we hope you enjoy this episode. What's up? Back at your BC Club, the Spin Zone, here to talk to a very impressive young man, Andrew J. Bauman. Now I say young man, but he is maybe older than me. John, I'm sorry, um, Andrew Bauman wrote a book recently called Stumbling Toward Wholeness. And then I went to his website at andrewjbauman.com. That's B-A-U-M-A-N. Uh, to kind of check out his stuff before I interviewed him. And I'm telling you, this dude has got some very interesting stuff at his website. Um, there's articles, Honest Misogynist Part 3, Learning to Write with Body and Heart, Fighting Clean, Tips of How to Argue Well. The dude wrote a book called The Psychology of Porn, A Brave Lament for Those Who Know Death. Uh, he's got Cool videos on here. Just a very talented guy that's got a lot of stuff going on for him. Way more accomplished than me as he is a also a therapist, probably has a master's degree. And uh, in fact, I know he has it. Let, let's just read this. Andrew J. Bauman is a licensed mental health counselor with a master's of art in counseling psychology from the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. He spent 10 years studying under Dan, uh, Dr. Dan Allender and his wife, Christy run Collective Hope Counseling in Seattle, Washington, and Andrew is the author of The Psychology of Porn and with Christy, uh, I think Christy helped him write that one, uh, but then also A Brave Lament. Andrew, we uh, en I enjoyed this conversation and I know everybody else will as well. So introducing to everyone, Andrew J. Bauman. Possibly more questions. All right. Well, well, this is Andrew yeah. Bauman uh, just telling you right up front. If if you hear something and you're like, man, I got to I gotta read more from this guy, you can look on our show notes, but it is Andrew Bauman, B-A-U-M-A-N.com. But like I said, it's uh, in... Yep. Yeah. Andrew J. Bauman. J. Yes. Com. Yes. Yep. I'm, I'm looking right at that J and I didn't even say it. So Andrew J. Right. Bauman.com. And man, I, I went on there today so there mm -hmm. goes the big secret i do my prep work for the interviews <laughs> the day of sometimes two That's days right. before right. hey but at least it was hours before so it wasn't there 10 minutes <laughs> but <laughs> but man you've got a uh you got a plethora of interesting reading material so what i Thank would you. like to do is is explore some of the content on your website a little bit, and then we yeah. can then we can talk specifically about stumbling towards wholeness. Your new book does that sound fine with you? So, sounds wonderful. Okay, yeah, cool. thanks. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. you had uh, it, uh, do you call them blog posts? I mean, I, yeah, okay, yeah, just yeah, writings, blogs, articles. Whatever. Yeah, sex, <laughs> so you have one, sex one hundred and one, one called "Hey Men, yep. Take Responsibility for Sexualizing Women." Um, mm -hmm. So let you know just. These are, these are the sorts of conversations that are just so important because I do think there's so many yeah. blind spots for the action, you know, for the men or for the white folks or, or whoever. But I also yes. I also get a sense personally, and we won't have we don't have to go into this that much, that it's also mm -hmm. becoming somewhat in an unhealthy way, a, an unsafe environment universally for people to be wrong publicly. Like, I think it's one, Ooh, it's, yes. it's one thing uh, to be found as a perennial racist who has been constantly taking advantage of minorities and then still doing that. And then he's caught and, you know, on a microphone right. saying something, it's a whole right. different thing from, you know, slipping up and telling a woman, pick, put your big boy pants on. Like, obviously that's right. a, that is a horrible thing to say to a woman, especially right. in this day and age. But someone who's been saying that for 40 years, slipping up and say that their career, <laughs> their career right. shouldn't be over. So there's a yes. lot, of, there's a lot of things that I think are, are unhealthy, but um, bad habits and how women and men are treated 
treated uh, unequally in the church, this can't be totally divorced from how women are talked about in the Bible, correct? I mean, yes. there, there's, yes. a, there's a tension. We learned a lot of this from the Bible. Now, I'm not saying that we, we read the Bible right, but this is where sure. we picked up some of our cues. Sure. Yeah. I mean, this is such a good, a good conversation and deep conversation. I come from it more of, and I talk a lot about this in my books, uh, my history of pornography. Yeah. Basically, I, I was addicted to it about 13 years. Um, and I was also a pastor, youth yeah. pastor, college pastor. And I learned, and the, and the entire culture affirms this, I learned how to sexualize how to objectify women. Yeah. Um, and, and the boys club of the church that I was a part of kind of affirmed that, right? We could joke behind their backs. We could, you know, women weren't allowed in our meetings. Uh, we were doing God's work and they were, you know, they could take care of the kids and help prepare our sandwiches. Right. Um, and dress modestly and outside the house. <laughs> oh, totally. So, and be a, free, be, be a freak in the bed, exactly. right? Like, you know, and it's just, it's so insane. And yet this type of misogyny and patriarchy is so deep, it became internalized. Even me as a minister, um, even more so, internalized. And I did not realize it until much later in my journey of maturation of like, what am I doing? Like I have become a part of the problem yeah. um, in, in regards to the, you know, the Me Too movement, um, sexual harassment, and like that became so ingrained in me of how I objectified women. I didn't even realize it was conscious yeah. until much later in my journey. And so that's a big part of what I do now as a therapist working with men, um, mostly evangelical men who are trying to learn what it means to actually learn to honor a woman instead right. of devour her. Um, and, and actually learn to what does it mean to actually become an advocate for women instead of uh, you know these passive aggressive abusers that many of the Christian men are right. So when you, when you read passages in the Bible that are clearly <laughs> more focused towards uh, a, a culture that was men dominated, do you see <laughs> do you see this as the Bible just giving a an expression of the culture in which it was written or do you yeah. see do you see certain things as huh maybe maybe there's some things that Paul says that we that we do need to read as more of his <laughs> cultural placement like I, yeah. I'm not sure if if that very smart, theologically sound woman shouldn't be teaching some of us knucklehead <laughs> men right now. Totally. Yeah, I really do think so much of it is cultural. And yeah. it's just it's some of it's just ridiculous what we continue to, you know, what we pick and choose. Right. It was like, why don't you have a head covering? Yeah. You know, why don't you have it's just it's just really sad how we pick and choose what we want to hear. Uh, and I, what I found is mostly it's just insecure men who want to retain their power and control. Yeah. Gosh, and, and and that that right there, I think, is the tough situation that we're in because when uh, and I don't know you well, but just what I'm picking up from you, I, I think I can say the same thing about you. Like guys like you and I, we have blind spots. We certainly mm -hmm. don't treat women perfectly, but sure. our our heart, our, our deepest, the deepest part of our heart. We want to learn how we can treat women equally. We yes. want to learn how we've been messing up. Yes. So there are guys that exist like you and I, but even us, like once, if our antennas of unfairness go up to, and it, and it has to do with defending a male that's in some sort of opposition with a female, we will get the hell blasted off this earth just right. just talking from a standpoint like like for example i will stick up uh it for any man for any woman for any black or white or whatever i'll stick up for anyone who is accused of something and if there is no evidence whatsoever my position would be hey ma'am you're saying this about him and we take it a hundred percent serious. We are so sorry right. that happened to you. Now our job is right. to be able to prove this. Otherwise in any situation, you can't just point to a, to a guy or a, a, a woman for that matter and say, you, you know, this person said this about you, therefore you're going to suffer the consequences. So it's right. just, it's just interesting the day and age in which we are in 
where I think maybe the best position that you and I can take is, hey, when it comes to this, we're just going to be listeners because yeah. Now I yeah, don't yeah. I don't think that's necessarily the perfect solution, but I think it may be the perfect right. solution for the the sensitivity of the times that we're living in right now. <laughs> sure. Like maybe women want us to shut the hell up. Is what I'm saying. Yeah. Right. 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 I, yeah. I mean, yes. Mansplaining. Right? right. I mean that we don't need the answers. And yet what I do realize is that one out of four women are abused. One right. out of three experience sexual harassment. One right. out of three, Gosh. you know, like, like this is so common. Right. Right. 70% Christian men viewing pornography regularly, 50% of evangelical pastors. Like, it is so like how we treat women is so deep. It's in our unawareness. So when women are telling their stories, I like to say like most likely I believe them. Right. Yeah. I lean on the fact of believing. But yeah, I'm not just gonna take everything. Like I want to know the truth. I want to know both of their stories. I want to know, but I also know that men have hidden behind these these systems of power and yeah. have used their power to get their way yeah, um, and have used it in such a way to harm. And I hear too many stories of sexual abuse, too much harm. I know I'm jaded right. um, in my own, my own story. Like I, I just, I've heard too much. Um, but again, I don't think it's my job to be the police. Right? Yeah. I don't think it's my job, to, but it is my job to listen. Sure. And, and, you know, you, I think you made a, a, a really good point too, that, that you know, you're basically saying, but dude, it, it is, it's an epidemic. It's everywhere, which yes. clued, which clued me in to what I think my problem is sometimes. Again, I'm not this perfect dude who didn't, uh, eye a woman up and down or, uh, never looked mm -hmm. at porn or I'm not, no way am I that guy, but, right. but I will say that with, with what, you, with what you're saying, I need to take a step back and be like mm -hmm. my context how I see this life is through the eyes of a guy that is trying yes. and most of yes. my friends and the people that I'm close to are scumbags, but they're trying not to be. So it's like, right. it's like everybody around me. We're like, Oh, I don't want to be that scumbag guy. I know I am sometimes but I'm working like, yes. like anything not to, I'm not around these guys that have no problem with mentioning a woman's breast in the elevator right. just you know when it's just the two of them. I don't I don't know who these people are. Sure. It seems right. foreign to me and you're telling me right. no this is the norm. So it's just right. like something that is the norm. My mind is processing it as people can't be that bad and that's and well, I have like, and I have no motivation to defend men. I don't care. Like I'm right. I'm I'm one of I right. guess 4 billion men so I'm not defending our gender but that is a right. uh, that's a a light bulb is going off in my head. Hey, this is normal. So it is something yes, to right. And, and I, you know, I'm similar. I, I feel like I'm surrounded by a lot of therapists and pastors and it's like my friend group is not, you know, we're pretty, try to be pretty honoring. And yet, you know, I just remember even last year, I, I, I'm a tennis player. And so I was at my, my tennis club and my coach was talking and he said something about like $2 whores. And then he made right. a comment about this woman's body. Yeah. Right. And all of a sudden I'm like, I freeze because there's, you know, this cool guy is awesome at tennis and I'm surrounded by a bunch of dudes. Right. People are, people are laughing. And all of a sudden I'm like, Oh God, like this is like, I, I need to stand up. Like this is yeah. me being a, by, a bystander, a participant in sexism. Right. Like I have to say something. And, and yet I, I was like, okay, I didn't laugh. I didn't, I tried to, And I, I didn't say something. I froze. Yeah. yeah. Um, I later went to the director. I reported it you know, all that, but it's still in that moment, I still feel shame of like, man, I should have said something. I, I wonder what I, I need to have more courage. And I say that because I believe a big part of, of the male culture is this passive bystanding that we do when, when they make a crude joke or a woman, yeah, a woman needs to be in the kitchen, right. <laughs> you know, and it's these really things, especially Southern culture where I come from, that is so, it's so um, pervasive and people think it's funny. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and that's my, uh, problem also is mm -hmm. being, is being from the South and honestly learning late into marriage, just how much this is affecting me. I mean, my, uh, yeah. my grandma passed away a couple of weeks ago and up mm. until her passing, if I walked into her house, 
I was one to be served. Now, mm, I didn't take yeah. advantage of that, but I also didn't rob her from that because through her lenses, that was how she was taught to show me love. She loved her grandkid. Sure. She didn't feel threatened sure. by me. She didn't. She definitely didn't feel inferior to me, but I yeah. was the man in the house and she Jeez. lived her whole life to say, wow. hey, sit down, let me get you a cup of coffee. You know, wow. and, and so it's yeah. like that kind of stuff is just, uh, it's, it's just and what intertwined. That, let, let, let me ask you this, Joey, what does that do to your unconscious? What does that do? I mean, what does that do to like, as you are a young boy, what does that do to little Joey's head? Like thinking about women unconsciously. Yeah. Like it's, it sets something exactly. up. Exactly. And, and, and here, and here's what's, here's what's really crazy about this too, though, is there's also something about that that is sacred in the same way that it would have mm. been if my grandpa did that for my grandmother. So yes, just yes. the fact that she is a female isn't it doesn't negate it and say, wow, she should no, her and grandpa should have been serving each other like that all yes. along. That's what love exactly. does. So if there some of go. so if some yes. of that is motivated in just a love for her husband, a love for her grandson, then that's great. Uh yes. I think the unhealthiness is that we know that she would go to work all day. Grandpa would go to yes. work all day. They would both come home. He'd sit down, take his shoes off, read the newspaper. <laughs> She's in right. the kitchen making supper, you know, and that's, yes, and that's exactly. Problem. I remember being, exactly. uh, let me be brutally honest with you too. This, this, I, this is just how I roll on podcasts. I just tell it all. I just did an Sounds interview. Good. I just did an interview with someone and I, I see, I, I take these things pretty hard. I'm pretty sensitive. I got off and I thought to myself, mm -hmm. am I the worst interviewer ever this is like the most <laughs> boring conversation i don't even know if I, I probably won't even air the episode this is such a breath of fresh air and it's telling me that it you got to just find people that are fun to talk to because now i just feel hey i'm not so bad at this this is fun man this guy's all right man all right so i'm back in go. a flow i was really sad when i got on with you but let me <laughs> so, so when funny. i was a uh when I was a sophomore, uh, and, and this just hit me recently too, how impactful this was. And here I am trying to do the right Christian thing. So there was a girl yeah. in English class, and she had uh, a, a very nice butt, and she was mm -hmm. wearing, I guess, what we would call, um, uh, what's, gosh, I can't even think of the exercise that people do that has Asian roots. Why can't I uh, think of it? Hey, I'm going the the stretching yoga yoga, yoga pants. in the world. There yes, so we call them yoga <laughs> pants. I don't think we called them yoga pants back then. But she basically mm -hmm. bent down to pick something up, and I had two guys um, mm. that were saying, "Joey, look, Joey, look," and I knew yeah. what they were telling me to look at. I knew yeah. they're just like, "Oh my gosh, the thing is so hot." So there gosh. I was as gosh. a legalistic Christian. I didn't want to do that because I felt like it was a sin. I wasn't really thinking. Sure. No one had taught me, hey, you can tell these guys right now, hey, you know what? You guys look, but I actually respect her more. Uh, there you I, go. I, it's just not her ass for me. I respect her as yes. a person, and I'm not going to do right. that. For me, <laughs> it was I've got to avoid this bad thing. And yes. I don't know how to do it confidently. And so I'm just going yes. to ignore these guys to the point where, right. I mean, th this is 1994. So then they started calling right. me gay. Oh, what are you gay? You can't uh, look at a girl's uh, butt or right. something. But anyway, uh, it, it right. clued me in just recently how that right there, it was centered around even a Christian perspective. But yes. I, I was carrying out something that said her, her butt is bad. Like that is yes, bad. Right. You don't right. look at that right, right. and not, right. not realizing that she is a person. First of all, that's a yes. butt for crying out loud. Not a big deal right. there. It's a butt. But, right. but lastly, why, why can't a woman's body be beautiful? At, yes. At, you yes. know, because God created her and then, Hey, it's yes. up to all of us to figure out not to do the objectifying, yes. but I want exactly. to, I want to be a little slow <clears throat> in, uh, in, in hammering guys who objectify only from the standpoint mm. of, Hey, let's also remember that they were taught to do this. And so it yes. is, even if they learn right now that this is incorrect, it will be a process to yes, get away from true. that. And I'm still in that process. Yes, I, yes, I, I well, find myself well in, said. yeah, I find myself in weak seasons to where if I see right. a hot girl at target, 
I I don't have the discipline and I just and I don't right. practice it. Now, those yes. are certain seasons right. and but I'm like I am objectifying her and there's no there's right. no getting around that. I right. just I did that. Yes. I did everything that I speak against. <laughs> right. And and I think I mean you name a, a lot of good points here and, and what I I wrote about this in, in uh, another book called The Psychology of Porn yeah. that I wrote. But basically the difference between uh, objectification and honor. And I believe we are called to honor beauty, yeah. not try to not try to devour it. Right. And so here in Seattle, when Mount Rainier's out, it's this beautiful awe. And I can look at Mount Rainier and say, Oh, God made her well. Right. Correct. She's she's beautiful. But I'm not going to imagine bending Mount Rainier over, you know, like derogatory right. Right. object objectifying things. And that's what we do to women. So what does it mean to learn how to handle beauty? Uh, you know, bear beauty well without turning into trying to objectify it and devour it. Right. Um, Because we don't know how to handle beauty. And and that's okay. That's been a long time problem of men. How do you, what's your relationship to beauty? And I know for me, 13 years of pornography, like that taught me what to do with beauty, which is devour it, um, pleasure myself with it and, and take without permission. Yeah. Do you, do you see, I mean, cause we're, I would say we, we've gone through some of the same church circles, probably a little similar in age. I, I would imagine you're a good bit younger than mm-hmm. me, but do you think that, uh, there were some very dark misleading parts about the whole purity culture, purity movement oh, and all that stuff? There, it, it birthed shame. Right. So what happens, what happens when you birth shame, you go underground with your sexuality. Yeah. Right. And so what happens to underground with your sexuality? Well, it creates a whole generation, especially young men who are addicted to pornography. No one learned how to talk about sex. Well, it wasn't it wasn't blessed. Sex is beautiful. Sex is great. Um, Here's how to how to bear it. Right. Here's how to talk about it. Here's how to you know, with my kids, we talk about their peanut. You know, my son, he was when he was two, he just start masturbating everywhere. All right. (laughs) And, And so it was just like. It was like, what in the world? In my own shame, my own, you know, he's, you know, grinding down his pants in the store. And I, and so like, okay, how do I not shame him? I don't want right. to shame him. He's just discovering his body. And so, I, you know, I, I'm finding, okay, hey, buddy, um, do you see anyone else touching their penis in the store? <laughs> you know, and, and he looks, he looks around and he's like, no, like he, no one else is touching their penis. That would have so been like, horrible oh. if he caught a dude <laughs> messing with himself. <laughs> <laughs> that would have not not worked. But luckily there was no nobody doing that and and basically trying to teach him that you can touch yourself in your own room. Right. You, can, you know, that's a that's a private thing. Touch your, you know, and using the proper names for their parts and and we openly talk about that with my, you know, now he's 5 and uh my daughter's 3 and and we have great talks about their bodies and sex. For me growing up in in the the church all I heard was no. Yeah. Sex Sex bad. Right. Don't don't do it. Right. Save yourself till you're married. You know, and that was the end of the conversation. I learned absolutely nothing until porn began to teach me about sex. Right. And that led me in another form of destruction. Yeah. 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 So I you know, and I don't I don't know it's I guess we just have to be like when when we teach purity, because I do think that ideally it seems as if maybe you would avoid more problems, more heartache, more potential for risk and all of that if you mm-hmm. did wait until you were married, but probably right. get married relatively younger than what the culture is is trending towards. Mm. So I, I so I get the eagerness and the passion behind trying to help kids stay away from painful experiences. But it yes. seems like maybe they need to talk a, a li- a, like you said, fundamentally, just a little more open about sex, but then also talk about how natural these feelings mm-hmm. are and the fact that you're super turned on by someone that's attractive. Right. God, who is all good, made you that way. And we yes, just have right. to figure out how to take all of those feelings and those hormones and, and, and put them to good use, which, yes, but, right. but you know, with me, I've got two girls and two boys and my boys are the youngest. So I've got a lot longer time to think about this, but mm-hmm. I don't want to, it, it's, it's, 
I've got to have in my mind that it is not the end of the world when any yes. of my kids start messing up sexually because, and, and right. whether that is I, I catch them watching porn, even though I want to try to protect them from that as much as I can, or right. um, uh, my daughter loses her virginity. I mean, I don't like thinking about that even after she's married for that matter, but any yeah. of that stuff, I, I want to go ahead and put my mind in a place where I recognize that is not the end of the world. It is okay. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, but I wasn't taught that I was taught. You pretty much screwed your whole life up if you yes. lose it before you get married. And that can't, that can't be healthy. Right. I mean, and, and I'm wondering, and I'm wondering, um, you know, your thoughts on your daughter's virginity versus your son's. Right. 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 I, I bet there it's more loaded probably for you thinking about your daughters and your sons. It is. It is. And, and, I, and, it, and I don't and know how to avoid own, that. Is that your own internalized sexism? Because I know I have yes. that as well. Yes. <laughs> I, right? I think it is. I, yeah. I, I certainly right. think it is. Because I uh, there was a guy at our uh, school that when he started uh, going on these little tantrums, I had to leave the room because he would talk, mm. he would talk about women in a way that was making him sound like the man, but making her sound horrible for giving it up early. Like he would mention, oh gosh, oh, I, I, tap, I tap that in two weeks, rolling oh, his geez. eyes in disgust about her. So I would, oh, but, but I would, so disgusting. it is, but I would say that yeah. is an extreme manifestation probably of me being a mm. little more okay with my son's Right. Having early sex more so than my daughters. Uh, right. Which you brought up that point. I do think that's deficiency on my part. And at the same time, okay. I, I do have a different relationship with my daughters than I do with my sons. And I kind of think it's because yeah. I still believe that there are in generalities and nobody fits the same mold. But I think if you, if you looked at the percentages, Females do have some stuff that they're they it's more common for them, and it's uh, what six times out of ten, seven times out of ten. I don't know, but I do think there's some more common ground amongst women and amongst men. But I know that sometimes mm -hmm. makes me a bad guy in some circles. But yeah, all right. Well, um, yeah. Let's let's talk about your book, uh, "Stumbling Towards Wholeness." Yes. Um, offers a new strategy for spiritual growth and life transformation, mm -hmm. regularly returning to the arms of a kind and loving father. Well, before we yeah. even do that, what it, it sounds like the word healness, uh, healing, uh, mm -hmm. um, or, or wholeness, wholeness, wholeness. Yeah. I like healness. <laughs> a healness is a new one. We right. coin right. that. What like is, that. uh, what is wholeness for you? Like, what does that look like? Yeah. Yeah. I think a big, a big part of, of my journey, uh, is learning to to heal, learning to be okay again. Uh, I went through, and I write a lot about it in my book. Um, you know, rough, rough childhood. Parents broke up. My father had a secret addiction. Cheated on my mom for years. It was a nasty separation. We went on vacation and just didn't go back to my dad. Yeah. Um, you know, it was just this this abrupt. And, and yet, he was a big time pastor and lawyer and vice president of a Christian college. Um, and we were this perfect family and it just ended up blowing up, uh, in a really public way. And that kind of set me off to begin to, as an eight year old, beginning to be completely alone, orphaned, um, having depression, beginning to develop some mental health issues. Um, and my mom just because of her own pain, just going numb for uh, the next 20, 20 years yeah. of this deep betrayal. All she wanted was this, you know, um, you know, classic, you know, family, <laughs> like, yeah. and it was just it exploded. Right. Um, and, and so that was kind of the stage for me beginning to try to figure out what is God? Like, you know, we grew up going 10 times a week, um, to church. And then now I'm beginning to, to face incredible suffering. Right. Um, so much so that, you know, 14 years ago, I ended up in a psych ward, yeah. um, you know, imagining, you know, nearly killing myself and that was kind of the beginning in a lot of ways for me to pick up the pieces and begin to make sense of my life, make sense of trying to make sense of, of God. Um, and now knowing part of my calling is to to help men who are suffering, you know, with addiction and heartache and, and relationships. And that's all that's all I do. Yeah. And, so what do you think that your uh, so obviously you have to, I, I think if you write a book on something, you have to feel like, well, you, you know, you at, at least have something 
somewhat of a unique way of looking at something mm-hmm. or else no business writing a book nobody's going to buy it <laughs> everybody already thinks sir so it is uh right. so just getting below the surface a little bit would you say that the main thrust of your point is that hey like don't don't be so on the offense as far as always trying to do us right always trying to avoid wrong but your mm-hmm. starting place is just receiving love from the father that's your starting yeah. place <clears throat> yeah, it's a, I mean, the, the way I frame it in the book is basically based on Luke 15, yeah. 11 through 32, the story of the prodigal, right? And so a lot of people's eyes will glaze over because they've heard the story a billion times. Yeah. And, and yet my take is basically all three characters are in us, right? They All three characters are alive in us. Father, um, and, older brother, younger brother. Exactly. And, and then we go through the realms uh, of each of those characters, right? In the sun realm, we have to enter our shame, our self-hatred, our addiction, and our, our ability we, to wrestle with goodness. And yeah. so that's, that's the, the younger son. We are all younger sons. It's easy to align ourselves with our own crap, right? Yeah. Like that's, that's easy. But then also, we're also all elder brothers. We also deal with our judgment, our entitlement, um, other centered contempt, hating other people, blaming other people for everything. Um, and and then the goal is to be like the father, right? The father, he befriended grief. He's immensely kind to both the, both the runaway and the arrogant douchebag that is the elder brother. Right. Um, like he, he embodies both and loves both. Uh, and welcomes them both to the party and celebrates wildly. And so that's how do we incorporate that within ourselves? Right. Because I know for myself, I've had immense contempt for my younger brother, right? My younger self. Um, I didn't even talk about my porn addiction for years because I had so much shame around it. Yeah. Um, you know, and I judged myself and I blocked myself from coming home. I blocked myself from from the celebration, from resurrection. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so that's sure. that, that's basically the, the essence of the book. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So like if someone comes to you as a friend and says, man, I have tried so many times to not end my days in, uh, in drinking. And I just, yeah, I find myself falling for it every time. Sometimes a friend's over and I think I'll just have one with him. Other times I just feel like I can't resist the temptation. I know, yeah. I know God has got to be sick of this, but I keep asking for forgiveness. But man, I'm almost getting numb to this because it's been going on for so many years. I feel like God is so disappointed. And mm. I just, I don't even know where to go from here. If he's asking you for counsel, like what would you yeah. say to, to a person like that? Yeah, I would say we got to get behind the addiction. Like the, the addiction is teaching him something about himself. And we got to, we got to look into what, what's there. What's he escaping from? What is the why of the addiction? Right. Yeah. And I, I, I specialize in, in sexual addiction. That's why I always talk about it so much. But, you know, for, for sexual addiction, um, we always have to look at the wounds that lead to the sexual addiction. Right. right? So what type what type of pornography are you looking at? The type what's what's your deepest, darkest sexual fantasy? And we take those and then we go backwards and we begin to go back to the wounds. All addiction is an effort to escape our woundedness. Right. That's what it's all about. So we can't just talk about the addiction. And that's where the church fails by just having moral conversations. I don't think moral, bad, good are necessarily helpful. We got to get to the core wounding. That's what it's about. Yeah, 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 for sure. And I mean, you know, I I think that what I mean, what do you think about this distinction? Like I have. I have readily admitted that this may be semantics, but I think that it's mm-hmm. there. It's important, and I and man, if I if I tweet anything like this, guarantee you, you will have five <laughs> people within two minutes, you know, having a problem with it. But I'm not so sure that if if you ask God, Lord, what is your main purpose for me? I don't mm-hmm. think He would say, "Well," and, and it, let, let's let's say I'm. I haven't confessed my sins or anything. I don't think he would say, well, first of all, we've got to take care of your sin problem. I think he would answer that by saying, my purpose for you is to be one with me. I just want to be with you. I want to fill you. I want to, but I think those semantics are so important because that, that is the real thing at play. That takes us to day one when God created us, he created us 
to be a recipient of his love. It was like a gift. Yes. Like you are entering my world and it is a gift. I know it looks pretty shitty yes. right now, but that was not the original intent. It is going to get a lot better, but all I want right. you to do is have a relationship with me and having a relationship with God that takes care of the sin problem. I mean, yes. It, right. Well, look again, go back to the story of the prodigal. What ha- the prodigal comes home. What if the father said, son, sorry, sorry, dude. Like, you, you can't, you right. can't come home. You know, you actually do have to work it off and yeah. you're never going to be work it off because it was a third of the estate and you'll never be able to pay it off. You suck. Right. Like, like I, that's not a very good story. Right. That's not, that's not redemption. Right. That's right. not, that that's not it. And, and what does he do is the exact opposite of what he deserves. Right. That's what makes grace so radical. Uh, and that's he- what makes the, the gospel thing's so cool. Yeah, and even even to the point where I'd say for argument's sake, I mean, it's a parable, but I would imagine we could probably say that father didn't know what his son was going to say. For all he knew, the son could have come back and say, hey, you owe me more money. You didn't give me yeah. enough. The father didn't care. Like, he just right. was like, my son is back. And so yes. it, even back in that time, it seems like it would be way more normal to say, okay, we got to make sure everything is cool here. What you did was dishonoring of our family. Do yes. you do you take that back? Do you recant? Are you, are you right. sorrowful? But there wasn't any of that. It was, I'm running towards my boy. That's all I want. You know? Exactly, exactly. And that's what makes it so beautiful. Yeah. And, and, and even thinking of the, the son began to recite what he was going to say, right? Right. Like on his walk back, hey, this is what I'm going to say. I'm going to say I don't deserve his love. I'm going to this. I'm going to say I'm going to work it back. He was prepared to be to be sent away, to be shunned, um, and, and it was that extravagant welcome yeah. that that is hopeful for me and is hopeful for my clients. Like, yeah. what does it mean to embody and integrate God's voice within yourself and welcome yourself back home? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I will say that one thing is that has been helpful to me, and I think a lot of people would say, yeah, heretical too. But for me, I I think being taking a little bit more of a mysterious approach to the Bible and and mm-hmm. maybe not assuming that I've been reading it right all this time, for for example, what mm-hmm. if what if that was their perception of what happened to Ananias and Sapphira that that God struck yeah. them down? What if they actually went to bed with uh, some sort of a uh, bug in their stomach that pretty much ended <laughs> up ended up killing them uh, with right, some right. sort of disease? But in their culture, they saw everything as a result of God. Oh, they yes, died. Right. Well, that was God. Oh, they lived. Yeah. That was God. And and why I bring that up is I think uh, that it's been helpful for me to recognize. Okay, I may not be me getting the full picture of this story, but as stories right. like that that I specifically picked because it's in the New Testament that throws us mm. for a loop. Because here you are writing a book about yes. a God that just wants to hold us and just wants to be there for us, and yet yes. these jokers withheld some money without telling. <laughs> and it seems like God just got murdered, got, I mean, up, got just boom. You know, I mean, w- w- wouldn't yeah. you say that's a part of the problem with us, with us mm-hmm. embracing that loving God? Because we we're reading a narrative where it seems like, why would God do that? I mean, I wouldn't do that to my kid. Yeah, totally. No. And, and again, I don't pretend to be a Bible scholar, yeah, yeah. even yep. though I write books about it. You know, it's like, I, I don't, I don't understand all those right. mysteries. Yep. And, and yet, um, and, and I feel like I do understand some. Yep. And yet, yeah, the story like that does throw me for a loop. And like, what? Maybe we don't know the whole story, which yeah, is sure. most likely true. Sure. Most likely true. Well, <laughs> I we, d- rarely, we rarely do. Just for the record, I wouldn't say this if you had tried to BS your way through that, but I respect you. Well. <laughs> I respect you a lot for being able to say, I don't know, because my gosh, that's 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 what our faith is about. It's like, yeah, I, yeah. I don't know. But here's here's what uh, here's what that made me think of. You know what you know about God because you mm-hmm. truly believe you've had a personal relationship with him. Mm-hmm. So there is something in you, and I would say in me too, that we can't prove to other people, but we have sensed and felt this mm-hmm. love from a father that 
we actually mm. can't make sense of that in the story of Ananias yes. and Sapphira. So some fundamentalists right. would say, well, you better figure out how to match up with that story because that story is in the Bible and the Bible reigns supreme. And I would say, sure. no, my relationship with God reigns supreme and I need his mm. guidance when I'm reading this yes. stuff because this stuff yeah, is sure. hard. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Well said. Yeah. <laughs> and I would say even for me in my journey, knowing feeling the presence of evil. In, yeah. in many ways, I've almost felt the presence of evil, sometimes almost more than the presence of God because of the work that I do. You know, I feel like I'm on the front lines of evil, um, working every day with those who've been both sexually abused and those who have abused sexually. And I feel like that has helped deepen my relationship with God because I see this darkness every day, um, which is a weird, this weird reality of like, wow, like I know God more fully because of the darkness that I sit with. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, um, feel free to advertise anything else, but I, you, you did bring up the, uh, I think it was, uh, didn't you write a book on porn? What'd you say? What was it called? Yeah, 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 yeah. I've written uh, three books, uh, the psychology of porn. You can get it on Amazon. All right. Uh, it's just small, small essays about objectification, uh, and, you know, about women's stuff we've been talking about, uh, wrote a book, uh, about grief, uh, about the, uh, loss of my firstborn son, oh my uh, gosh. which is a, a tragic, tragic story. And we also did a documentary, uh, on that. You can watch it on Amazon prime yeah. called a, Bra a brave lament in the book as well. And then this is my most recent book, stumbling towards wholeness. Gotcha. Stumbling towards wholeness. Hey, uh, yep. For for sure, and you don't have to tell me on air, uh, obviously. But I would, yeah. uh, if you tell that story, I would love to mm -hmm. hear it. We actually talk mm -hmm. uh, super tragic stuff on here, um, but I, yeah. I I also understand not everybody's at a place where they want to go there, and they may never be. But I would I yeah. would love to hear that story. Maybe Amazon is is where to watch it. Uh, but I'm yeah, sorry you man. went through that, man. Gosh, yeah, I just man. can't even yeah, imagine. Yeah, horrific uh, about six six years ago. And uh, yeah, I'd love for you to watch the film and yeah. then uh, be glad to you know either come on again and we can talk about it and uh, talk about the grief. And that's basically the things that I talk about and write about, porn, grief, and, and healing. So there you go. My, awesome, man. Those are my, those are my things. You got a, you got a couple <laughs> of, of people that are influencing you these days, just out of curiosity, people that you're reading their books or listening to their lectures yeah. or anything like that? Yeah. I mean, I've got, you know, I'm a fan of a bunch of different folks, but, uh, you know, big influence in my life is Dr. Dan Allender. Yeah. Uh, stu you know, studied under him for, for 10 years. Um, been working with uh, Dr. Robert Masters, his book "To Be a Man" yeah. um, has been influential. Um, yeah, so there's you know, so many good good awesome. folks out there. I appreciate so, it, man. Andrew Bowman dot yeah. com, Andrew J Bowman dot com. You guys go check it out. Read read a few of his articles uh, for beginners, and then uh, grab one of these books, man. I appreciate yeah. your time. Yeah, thank you very much for having me.